Welcome everyone to the Disassemble the Arts, an ongoing arts and accessibility program. This month we are featuring the Toronto-based artist Cyrus Marcus Wares. As we have gathered here digitally, I just want to take a moment and think through our land acknowledgement and think about how we can continue in solidarity with the indigeneity of the land. I'm currently located on the traditional and unceded lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples and the Wasanic peoples. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within these technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many Indigenous communities. These technologies leave significant carbon footprints contributing to climate changing climates that are disproportionately affecting Indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me and acknowledge all of this as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to continue our role in reconciliation, decolonization, and or allyship. And I, and I think also thinking through the situation right now and in terms of what we're going to be talking about, um, we want to think about all of this in relation to Indigenous communities, both in Canada and across the world. My name is Regan Shrum. I am currently the Assistant Curator at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. I'm a queer and disabled individual living on the Congan speaking territory. I have fair skin, long brown hair, that's right now any ponytail, and I'm currently uh, sitting behind a white background and sitting on a brown couch. If you have any trouble, um, please use the chat, uh, private chat, to message me to um, uh, so I can figure out any kind of technical issues that you, you are dealing with. The built-in audio output in, is in your computer's external uh, speakers. You may also use your phone. If you are going to be using the phone, please make sure that you disconnect from your computer uh, so you don't hear, uh, so we don't hear both of you. Today's presentation is conducted over the sh a screen share, um, so you may want to adjust your viewpoint on the top of your screen, uh, so you can have it um, more to the needs. We ask uh, at the end, we're going to have about a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and answer session. We ask for accessibility reasons that you don't use the chat function. Uh, for those using screen readers, They'll be actually uh, hearing everything that is being typed out along with hearing people speak, and it can be very distracting. So we ask you instead to use the Q&A uh, function um, while at the end of the session. If you would like to leave the, the webinar early, uh, that is totally fine. There will be a recording of this session that will uh, happen in about a week or two. Um, the leave meeting button is on the uh, lower right hand side, so please take advantage of that at any time. In uh, a week or two, I will be sending up a follow up email with today's recording, with a transcript, and with feedback uh, of the workshop. And now I will introduce Cyrus. Cyrus is an assistant professor at the School of Arts in, at McMaster University. He is a Vayner scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks and Black activist culture. And he's shown widely in galleries and festivals across Canada. He's a core team member of Black Lives Matters Toronto, a part of the Performance Disability Arts Collective and an ABD PhD candidate at York University in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. His ongoing curatorial work includes That's So Gay, which is part of the Gladstone Hotel from 2016 to 2019, and Blackness Yes slash Blackarama. He's the co-editor of the best-selling Until We Are Free Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada, which just was released uh, this year. 
So I will leave it to you, uh, Cyrus. Thank you so much. I guess at the credit, this is Three Fires Territory. It is the territory of the dish with one spoon wampum, and it is also a part of Treaty 13. Uh, I continue to be so thankful for the chance to get to live and work in these territories. And I know that my work <clears throat> supporting and fighting for Black liberation must come in solidarity with and in conjunction with supporting Indigenous resurgence in order to ensure that we all get to be free. So thank you. Um, so a little bit about myself. <clears throat> I'm a, a Black, trans, disabled, and mad uh, artist, parent, educator. I have uh, brown skin, very long uh, blonde dreadlocks. They're maybe four or five feet long. Um, and I'm wearing an orange hat and a green vest and a silver ginkgo biloba leaf earring to help me remember things because I have a memory impairment. I'm wearing glasses and I have a background behind me of a monument in the United States that has uh, been taken over by BLM protesters and they've painted with beautiful bright colors messages of hope and survival all over what was once a Confederate monument. So that's what I'm in front of in my background. So I want to uh, start sharing my screen and I want to tell you just a little bit about my work and my practice and about how I've tried to uh, make space and create space for uh, um, us to be able to bring disability into our conversations and into our creative practice. Um, a little of this image on the screen right now is an image of four uh, gender fabulous Black queer people uh, look dressed in Afrofuturist attire looking down at us through a camera lens and the screen title says Irresistible Revolutions. And really, <clears throat> that is what my work is trying to do. It's trying to get at this Tony Cade Bambara quote from 1982 that the role of the artist from the marginalized or oppressed community is to make the revolution irresistible. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on, but that's something that is really guiding my work. Uh, I am a PhD candidate at York University, and I'm doing a PhD specifically looking at disability in the arts and the ways that disability deaf and mad uh, artists are engaged with or not engaged with within the contemporary arts milieu and what is happening in, our, in these environments in terms of supporting um, and advancing the careers of deaf, mad uh, and disabled artists. My work is largely rooted in activism. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm interested in exploring black activist culture through my practice. And to me, activism and speculative fiction go hand in hand. Uh, dreaming of the future, Afrofuturism, and imagining a world wherein we get to be free, that's what we're doing when we're doing activism. Walida Imarisha, in a book called Octavia's Brood, which was all people writing in the spirit and uh, energy of Octavia Butler, a black speculative fiction writer. Um, in the Octavia's Brood, Walida and Marisha says that in fact, all activism is speculative fiction. So on the screen right now is another uh, clip uh, from a video that I made of a bunch of Afrofuturistic looking uh, folks staring out at the screen. And the text says, whenever we try to imagine a world without war, <clears throat> a world without violence, a world without prisons, without capitalism, we are engaging in speculative fiction. All organizing is speculative fiction. And so this idea that as artists, as creators, uh, we're getting to imagine the future in the same way that speculative fiction writers are doing it. And in fact, she's saying that as artists, we actually are you know, in the best possible position to help people to imagine the world that we're trying to get to when we talk about abolition, when we talk about liberation, when we talk about life after the revolution, when we talk about what kind of world we want to emerge out of COVID into. You know, it's artists who are helping us to paint the picture of what that might potentially look like. I also root my work largely in disability justice. 
So as a disabled artist, as a mad artist, to me, it's been very important to draw on the important work of BIPOC, QT BIPOC, uh, disabled, uh, mad and deaf folks who have done such incredible work to say, we need to talk about our experiences intersectionally. We need to prioritize and support Black and Indigenous leadership. And we need to make sure <clears throat> that when we're doing work, it's all of us for all of us. And if any of us are left behind, it's not the revolution. So uh, very thankful and indebted to disability justice practitioners who have helped me to think through uh, how I wanna ground my practice. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about a project that I, uh, uh, I did that was aimed at addressing uh, madness, and, uh, essentially, and, and addressing our, our, our mental health and our survival. This project was called Activist Love Letters, and it was first performed in 2012 at the Feminist Art Gallery. And uh, on the screen, you see a close-up uh, image of a, a letter that an activist has written to Kurt Gomberg, and it says, Dear Activist, it is another strange day for me. And then the rest of the text is cut off. And then you also see a small image of uh, people gathered around a table writing letters together. So what Activist Love Letters did was it gathered people together, strangers, to uh, you know draw inspiration from these incredible letters that activists have written to each other over time. So thinking here of James Baldwin writing to Angela Davis when she was in prison, that famous letter that not only critiqued America for once again placing an image of a Black person in chains on the cover of a magazine, but two, for saying we all must fight for Angela's life as if it were our own. And of course, he famously closes with, for if they come for you in the morning, they will be coming for me at night. Therefore, peace, Brother James. So thinking about those letters, thinking about the le letters that Leonard Peltier, Indigenous uh, political prisoner, uh, wrote to Mumia Abu-Jamal, a Black a political prisoner, <clears throat> encouraging us to fight for his freedom. So all these incredible letters that are unseen and kind of invisible that activists have written to each other. I was interested in, uh, in showing those and talking about the relationships that activists have built uh, across great distances and uh, often across a generation divide in the case of the Baldwin and Angela Davis letter, um, where people came together to say, you know, hey, I see what you're doing and I just want to support you. The second part of the project was to invite these strangers that I had gathered together to write a love letter to an activist in their community, to pick somebody to write to, uh, and then to send them a message of love and care that we get sent through the mailways. So this image on the screen <clears throat> is a close-up of a, a, a line, a, a fishing line, a clothes line, uh, with a whole bunch of bios of different activists pegged up uh, along the line and a bunch of letters that people have written uh, posted up on a gallery wall. So for this project, I would post up uh, these, these bios of activists working all across uh, the north part of Turtle Island and Inuit Nunagat, but also in the south. Um, and I would often, you know, try to find bios of the particular people who were organizing in the community where the performance happened. And I would invite people to write to uh, one of these folks or maybe to write to somebody in their life who they've always wanted to reach out to, to say, oh, by the way, here, you know, this thing that you do, thank you, or I've always wanted to tell you this. Uh, anyways, I collect these letters um, <clears throat> and I have mailed thousands of them. This is a, an image of a whole bunch of letters pinned up on a gallery wall and there's just tons and tons and tons of them. This is another image of a whole bunch of letters pinned up on a wall with one of them written in giant red letters, the words, you are amazing. Imagine getting that in the mail. Um, so all of these letters, I, I include uh, information about how people can write back uh, to me and I have gotten uh, tons of responses. I've mailed thousands of letters all over the world at this point since I've been doing the project for eight years. And I've got some incredible responses. And most people say that the letters came at the exact right moment, that moment when there was self-doubt or questioning, what is my next move? Am I making a difference? Is this work doing anything? And then you get this letter in the mail from a complete stranger saying, oh, by the way, <clears throat> your work is actually touching me. It's affecting my life. And it's been an incredible project. One of the letters that I draw inspiration from is this letter from Tucker Gomberg, who was a white uh, activist, environmental justice activist, 
based here in Toronto, but also working out in the West Coast in Alberta. Um, and he wrote this open letter to all activists just before he died um, because he had a, a deep depression. Uh, and he wrote this letter and he encouraged us to stay strong, but that the way that we needed to do that was to build relationships outside of our activism, to build networks of care while we were well, so that when we get sick or if we get sick, we have support systems, support networks around us to help us to do the, to, to engage and to be there, um, to do the activism, but to not overdo it, I think is how he says it, to make sure that you have other interests and hobbies and things in your life that bring you joy and value. So that if you get sick and you can't <clears throat> be involved in organizing, you still have things in your life that are sort of enjoying and sustainable. And I read aloud from that letter uh, at the end of every performance for the last eight years, because I think those words are so sombering and so harrowing. We need to make sure that, that all activists, in fact, actually have a support network around them, that they are supported when they are struggling because we know activism can cause intense burnout and that they have support around them in order to, as Tucker Gomberg says in the letter, be able to live to fight another day. So through this process of uh, writing uh, letters and uh, receiving letters back and getting to know all of these different activists, I became very interested in wanting to get to know these people a little bit deeper, just wanting to get to know them and understand their work, their being, their interests, their loves. And so I started drawing them. I started drawing activists <clears throat> larger than life. Um, so making portraits that were 10 feet tall and six feet wide of activists um, uh, through a process of interviewing them and asking them about their work and um, really taking up this charge of what would it take to create resilient conditions for activism? What would it take to create the kinds of conditions where people could stay engaged in organizing and mobilizing over a period of time with breaks and with community support, with mutual aid built in, rooted in disability justice, where there is a slowness, where there is a care built into the work, what would that take? And so one of the things that I wanted to offer was these acts of reverence, these celebrations of activist labor, of activist lives, of activist love. So I started drawing these people larger than life. And what better way to get to know them than to get to ask them all of these questions, but also to get to trace every line on their face, you know, and really get to understand the shape of their being. So this is a, a portrait I did actually in 2015, um, shortly, or uh, 15 or six, yeah, 15, uh, shortly after the killing of Eric Garner by the police. And his famous uh, last words were, uh, I can't breathe. And and uh, this is a portrait of an activist in Minnesota. Um, and she was attending a protest in the Mall of America and they did a massive protest and shut, shut down the mall and it was incredibly successful. And uh, they had all put masks to, to contain their identity. And she had written, I can't breathe on uh, this hospital mask. And I was so struck by that image. And so I, and so I drew her. Um, and of course now in 2020, this drawing has seemed so, um, uh, interesting to me because it has all of these other meanings. Of course, as we know, this summer, the police continued to attack and kill Black people, Indigenous people, mad people, and they killed uh, George Floyd. And famously, his last words were also, I can't breathe. And this image of somebody with a mask on, of course, in 2020, because of COVID, because of the pandemic, has this whole other weight to it. Um, interestingly enough, this was the only activist that I had ever drawn uh, in this series that I hadn't met first. I had seen this image and just felt compelled to draw it. Uh, through organizing and through activism and building networks of care, I met Niski Noir, an activist and organizer with Black Lives Matter in the States, uh, who is based in Minneapolis. And I, I was, uh, you know, showing them my artistic practice and I was showing them some of the drawings and they saw this drawing and they said, oh my gosh, I know that that's Femiola, I know them. And uh, was able to put us to, in touch. I was able to share the drawing and so now we're connected. So now the loop is closed all of the activists in the activist portrait series are people that I'm connected with through organizing and activism. These drawings take an incredible amount of time and labor and in part that's part of my embedding disability justice into my work as a disabled artist. I've been very interested in figuring out how to 
be in this body, <laughs> the meat sack, as they call it. How do you exist in this body uh, and do the things that you want to do? And I've been very interested in pushing to see where my limits are. And so when I initially started doing drawings like this one of Josh Vedavelu, um, I was very interested in drawing it in a, in a long durational chunk. So I drew for about 85 hours straight with short breaks for sleep and food just to see if I could do it. I have uh, you know, a couple of autoimmune diseases and my mobility, you know, isn't guaranteed for, for uh, I won't be able to do that for forever. And I wanted to see if I could do it in this moment. And so I drew this in a long durational chunk uh, during a, a residency at the Art Gallery of York University. This is a portrait of Queen Titi Opalecki. And uh, much like most of the people that I interviewed and, and, and photographed, she said, I don't know if I'm an activist. I don't know if I've done enough to consider myself an activist. And it's interesting because most activists that I talked to and organizers were like, oh, I don't know if, I, if I've done enough to, to, to give myself that title, yet they were doing all of these incredible things. And so there was this myth of the super activist out there who's doing all the things all the time that we seem to compare ourselves to in order to understand whether we can consider our work to be part of the movement for Black Lives or the movement for social change or whatever it is that we're fighting for. Interestingly enough, Queen Titi Opalecki uh, and her son uh, started an organization called Prosthetics for Foreign Donation when her son, who is an amputee, uh, found out that he couldn't recycle or, or donate or reuse his prosthetics as he outgrew them. And of course, in Nigeria, where they're from, and of course, in all these other places, there were so many people who were really looking for prosthetics and needing them. And so they decided to create an organization that would collect prosthetics from all over and then redistribute them worldwide. So that's what prosthetics for foreign donations do. And the last time I checked with their numbers, they had collected over 60,000 prosthetics and sent them all over the world. But she still wasn't sure if she had done enough to consider herself to be an activist, which is so incredible to me. Uh, so this gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, this is Queen Titi here, uh, and you can kind of see she's about six foot two, maybe. So you can imagine how tall this drawing actually is uh, in comparison. Uh, these drawings are moments of capturing activists' lives. They create an archive of activism in this moment. I ask all of the people that I had drawn the same three questions. I asked them to talk about how they got involved in organizing. I asked them a speculative fiction question because what Walida Imarisha said is true. All activism is speculative fiction because we are daring to dream that another world is possible. So I asked them if they could travel through anywhere in time and space to any point in human history to get involved in a social movement or an activist moment, where would they go? And when would they go and why? And it's amazing to watch people's faces change as they start to imagine. And I take lots of photographs while they're talking and capture these moments of joy and these moments of reflection and these moments of somberness. And then that's what I end up drawing. This is Tandy Young, um, a housing activist and mental health activist uh, here in uh, Toronto. Sometimes I draw two people together and kind of show the relationship. This is Dainty Smith and Keisha Williams, two uh, chronically ill and disabled uh, femmes who uh, do work and organizing here in Toronto. This is uh, Omi Shrey Dryden, a disabled uh, professor and activist who started the Got Blood to Give campaign, uh, trying to ensure uh, the end of the blood ban and has done some incredible work in the movement for Black Lives and around disability justice as a disabled activist is now based in Halifax. Uh, so getting to draw these people large and really just celebrate them, uh, their organizing. This is one of the youngest freedom fighters. This is, uh, um, a young freedom fighter from Black Lives Matter Freedom School, uh, paired here in an image with Kim Nkuru, a Black woman of trans experience who has done incredible work uh, uh, to support uh, and, and engage uh, trans justice and trans liberation. So these portraits are acts of reverence and love. We also know that portraiture is definitely implicated in uh, creating conditions of who we consider to be inherently valuable and who we don't consider to be involved. You know, who gets to have their portrait taken and who gets to have their portrait drawn is definitely tied up with ideas of who is considered inherently valuable. So who normally gets their portrait painted is like kings and 
popes and university presidents and uh, university hospital administrators. And instead, in this image, we have a, a these are all graphite drawings, black and white uh, portraits of queer, trans, disabled, mad, and deaf folks. Uh, this is Melissa Watson and uh, Hampton Gerbrandt, uh, Melissa uh, organizing out of Toronto, uh, Afro-Indigenous uh, artist and activist, and Hampton, a musician and organizer uh, based out on uh, Coast Salish territory in Vancouver. Um, this is Miski Noir on the left here, a portrait of Miski uh, wiping uh, something off of their glasses and looking boldly into my uh, camera lens. Uh, this is the person who connected me with that activist that was in the first image. Uh, and of course, an image here of Kona Katrana on the right, la uh, bursting into laughter, uh, showing you that black queer joy. Uh, uh, Kona, an organizer and activist uh, based in Vancouver. This is uh, Troy Jackson and Alfred Kaki, uh, two uh, masculine uh, identified folks sitting in loud, uh, vibrant printed uh, suits, uh, smiling, one looking away and one looking at the camera. Um, again, drawn in black and white, showing uh, both introspection and also black queer joy. So I became very interested in these portraits as a way of ensuring resilience, as a way of supporting our survival. These images of Black, queer, trans, uh, disabled, mad, and deaf uh, people uh, as activists who are doing such incredible labor on the front lines of our movements that I wanted to, to, to really celebrate these folks and to say thank you and thank them for their organizing and to make uh, activism seem permeable and accessible so that people who are looking at these portraits want to get to know the folks that they're looking at. They want to, to find out more about them and want to figure out maybe, maybe even how to support their organizing and uh, their lives. I started thinking a lot about these portraits and how they could be used in other ways to support uh, at the lives of activists and uh, are mobilizing and organizing. So I started creating wallpaper of the, act of the activist portraits as a way of changing the environments that we live in. Um, there's this strange phenomenon of tall wallpaper, which is a type of wallpaper uh, that is sort of a historic style that often features drawings, line drawings of uh, either uh, rich white people uh, doing uh, relaxing things in the countryside, these bucolic scenes, maybe swinging from a tree on a swing, or images of indentured labor uh, folks happily working in the field as if this was something that any of us wanted to be doing. And this is repeated over and over again, like a wallpaper pattern. Very strange. So I was like, why do people put those in their bathrooms? Why do we, why do we keep, do we don't, we don't even know who these people are in the drawing. Why do we do this? What would happen if instead we had wallpaper that was images of activists? What if that's what we started our day with? What if that's how we first uh, embraced our morning was going into the bathroom and seeing images of George Jackson, uh, Black Panther Party uh, organizer in uh, San Quentin prison? Um, you know, what, what would happen if we saw images of organizers in our community? So what's on the screen now is uh, five sheets of black uh, and white wallpaper that uh, features repeated patterns of the activist drawings in a sort of kaleidos kaleidoscope design. Uh, there's a close up on the screen right now of a kaleidoscope design of a drawing that I did of George Jackson, a uh, black liberatory organizer who became politicized while in prison and was killed while in prison uh, by the prison guards um, and was a freedom fighter for black liberation. Uh, this is uh, on the screen, the image of the person with the mask that said, I can't breathe, that I talked about a moment ago from Yola, but now uh, turned into wallpaper in a repeated pattern that goes up and down that almost looks floral or, or shape-like. Um, again, another example of wallpaper. This is an image of Nzinga Maxwell, uh, amazing Black activist here in Toronto who was picked up by uh, Ryerson Campus Police uh, and uh, through collusion with the Canadian Border Services As Association and agency and uh, deported uh, in 2006. And a lot of organizing happened to try to stay the deportation. Um, and the memory of her activism lives on here in Toronto. This is her repeated over and over again as wallpaper. 
And again, this beautiful image of Kim Nkuru and her incredible and tireless work uh, for Black justice, for trans justice, uh, again, turned into this almost ethereal uh, floral uh, pattern uh, repeated as wallpaper. Uh, this is uh, this last image I'll show you of the wallpaper is of it installed at the Leonard Baird Gallery in Montreal uh, in one long uh, wall. And again, it just creates this completely transformed environment, an environment in which activism is thriving. There are activists covering every surface and an environment wherein we are experiencing Black queer joy and where we are just that much freer. So my work is really interested in trying to make sure that we all make it, that we all survive. I started doing a project in 2019 that was uh, performative, that involved installation and drawing and performance around this idea of survival in the future. So if all activism is speculative fiction, because we're daring to dream that another world is possible, what would it look like to create an act of, uh, a project that was a sci-fi story that was about activism. So I created a story called Antarctica and on the screen is a map of Antarctica that I drew um, that shows the way that it's been divided up into pie-shaped future colonies uh, claimed by a bunch of different countries uh, in the world, which is a true thing. Um, and I, I told the story, a fictitious story, about a time in 2025 when the people who had been sent to Antarctica to be born to stake a future land claim, were, which really did happen, uh, were called home to actually start the process of colonization, asking, will, coloni will humans ever realize that colonization is never okay? So on the screen is an image of the three actors in the play, Raven Wings, Dainty Smith, and Yusuf Kadura wearing the white paper suits that were a standard issue of the Antarctic company, uh, staring out at the camera looking bold and strong. In this story, uh, there are three characters, and uh, the first one is Sabian. Uh, she is a trans woman. She is uh, um, an activist before she gets sent to Antarctica, and she's just dead set on not following the company's wishes and instead trying to encourage the others to escape to freedom to an unclaimed part of Antarctica. Um, the, uh, Sabian convinces uh, Marcus, uh, one of the other characters, a uh, racialized, disabled uh, um, uh, character who is kind of going along with it because with the wishes of the company because he wants to have a safe place for himself, but he is in love with Sabian and so he agrees to, to go on this adventure. And then lastly, there's the, an image here on the screen of uh, Dainty Smith as Jessica, the last character in the play. And she uh, needs a lot more convincing. And it sort of goes through what happens when we try to talk through uh, resisting colonization and what that could look like. You can see an image on the screen here. In addition to the drawing of Dainty uh, as Jessica, there's a whole bunch of jars uh, with Antarctic ration labels on them. And you can sort of see how in this installation there were jars and things that you could touch. It was completely tact tactile. There were textiles that hung from the ceiling that were all white, referencing white supremacy. And all of the materials, all of the books, all of the letters, everything could be read through, everything could be touched. There was audio. Um, there were, it was a very accessible, interactive installation during which in the installation, three times a week, a 30 minute play that told the story of the Antarcticans uh, played out uh, in the installation. So this is the drawing of uh, Dainty Smith as Jessica, and this is Yusuf Kadura uh, as, um, uh, as Marcus, a, a, a drawing, and this is the real Yusuf Kadura standing in front of a drawing of Yusuf Kadura in the installation, again, just to show you the size and scale. So working on Antarctica was a way of imagining a future where maybe it's a little bit more dystopian, uh, you know, maybe we'll make it, maybe we won't make it, but the idea that uh, there's still a fight, uh, there's still a fight ahead of us, that we have work ahead of us as climate change rages on, and as things like viruses, you know, become a thing, you know, how are we uh, as, as BIPOC folks going to be there for each other and show up for each other and ensure our survival? I also did a project in 2019 for the Biennial that was, again, aimed at imagining a future that is decidedly utopic, wherein we have survived. 
So what better way to support disability justice than to create a future where Black and Indigenous, disabled, deaf, and mad people have survived and are thriving. So on the screen are eight different images of Black, uh, queer, and trans, disabled, uh, and mad uh, folks uh, in futuristic attire looking out at the screen doing various things uh, that are part of the story called Ancestors Do You Read Us? So in this um, story, this is the title wall from the exhibition. In Ancestors Can You Read Us? Dispatches from the Future. It was set in the year 2072 and uh, they, our great grandchildren, have figured out a way using old technology to patch through into uh, 2019 to give us a message from the future, a message that uh, tells us uh, that it's time to act, to rebel, to overthrow capitalism, to fight back uh, against uh, white supremacy, and to ensure that they get to live in this glorious future. So uh, here is a mad artist, uh, Gloria Swain, playing one of the characters from 20, uh, 2072, and disabled artist Raven Wings, uh, again, uh, playing a character from 2072, uh, looking out at the screen in black Afrofuturist uh, attire with neon lights. This is an image of the video installed at the Salah Bashir New Media Wall at the Ryerson Image Center, which is where it was on display for three months. So the presumption of the video was that that, that wall was what they patched into. So our great great grandchildren were like, oh, I can get a message to the media wall. And they patched this message through. Um, and uh, told the story uh, of a potential future only if we act now. So I want to, um, this is uh, one more image of uh, Rodney de Verlis, uh, Sylvia Rivera, and some of the protests in Hong Kong. I want to close out by talking about one more project called Radical Love. And this project was aimed at supporting and ensuring trans survival. Trans people rarely get to live to be elders. We just had Trans Remembrance Day earlier this week. And we know that we need uh, to create a space where Black trans people, Afro-Indigenous trans people, uh, Indigenous trans people uh, survive and thrive. On the screen is a beautiful image of Raven Wings looking out at the screen. I created a series of light box monuments that lit up at night that had an audioscape that you could listen to of their voices and that were these visual images that you could touch that, were the, that had audio and visual uh, image you could explore either or any all um, that were lit up in the middle of the night uh, addressing the fact that for a lot of trans people, they felt safer at 2 a.m. than they did at 2 p.m. because of the risk of running into transphobic people in the middle of the day. So I created these um, images of Black and Afro-Indigenous trans women and non-binary people uh, just being their bold, uh, amazing, creative, brilliant selves. Um, and, uh, and, and it was called Radical Love. And I'll just end with a couple of words from Monica Forrester, who is one of the people who were included in the project. I had asked her if she could describe her ideal future, her ideal city. And she said, I would be looking around me and I would see my Black family, my Black queer and trans family, living their best life, getting their best life. That's what I picture as being the root of what we do, the root of what we build for, really embodying what nothing and no one being disposable means, you know. So this idea that comes again from disability justice, that it's all us, uh, all, nothing without us, about us without us, and that if, it's, if we're not all involved, it's not the revolution. These are some posters I had made uh, supporting uh, mad justice. This one says freedom for mad people, support us, don't control us. Because during the pandemic, I found that I didn't feel desire to draw. I wanted to make digital work that was readily accessible and that I could put out quickly. This uh, is a poster that has turquoise lettering that says, stop using crazy when you mean anything other than crazy. So your popcorn isn't crazy. The movie wasn't crazy. Like, let's actually use that word in a different way. Uh, this is a, a drawing I did of Marsha P. Johnson with a, a beautiful African print backdrop. And it's a quote from Marsha P. Johnson that says, I may be crazy, but that don't make me wrong. So again, just creating work that supports and that celebrates the perspective of Black mad people, of um, Black disabled people, and, uh, and, and Black deaf people.
Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, my work is rooted in this quote from Tony Cadenbera. We have a beautiful image of a black trans person with their fist up, a uh, disabled black trans person with their fist up, uh, surrounded by pink uh, smoke bombs. And uh, the quote on the side says, as a cultural worker who belongs to an oppressed people, my job is to make the revolution irresistible. And that's the quote from Tony Bambera that guides all of my work. So thank you so much for uh, the chance to um, share uh, my work with you. And I would love uh, to go to any questions that you may have uh, as we, uh, anything that might be coming up. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cyrus, for that. Um, just a reminder uh, for folks to use the Q&A um, if possible, so it can be a little bit more accessible. Uh, but just coming, like, thinking through what you just spoke to, things that really um, made me so excited was, was to think of activism as that speculative fiction. That That's a, a concept I've never heard before and, and one that makes me very excited of expanding what we can really do uh, as, as a community um, that our imagination can really take us anywhere. Um, yeah, and also the myth of the super activism, I think we all had that feeling like we need, and maybe it's just this capitalistic production of we need to be doing more and more and more. Um, when, when your work really reminds me of uh, um, th that Instagram uh, of, of the Ministry of Rest, uh, yeah, the Nat Ministry. Yeah, yeah, and, and exactly, and uh, yeah, exactly. And this is this idea that you know one of the things that is has always been true is that we have always done activism for our, from our beds. We have always, from Harriet Tubman running the Underground Railroad as a disabled woman and doing organizing from her bed to uh, us doing it in the pandemic, disabled folks have always been able to do incredible amounts of organizing from our beds. It's only now that we're saying, oh, by the way, like let's remember that like we we need not have an ableist society tell us that it doesn't count because it's not happening on Young Street or marching down Portage, you know, because it's coming from our beds that somehow uh, we don't often, because of, yeah, because of this capitalist idea, we don't think of it, but it, but there's, and you just think about how much has happened. I mean, how much disabled, deaf and mad folks have shaped our response to this pandemic, how we're gonna survive, what we need to prepare for, how we're gonna do online, how we're gonna handle isolation, how we're gonna do disability justice, how we're gonna do mutual aid, what does community care look like? It's all coming from disabled people. Like they're literally su supporting an entire world right now who is freaking out because they haven't had to live with these conditions before, conditions that are all too familiar. With so many of us, I have immune issues. I'm, I'm often not going out. So, you know, for many of us, this is nothing new, but for, for a lot of people it is. And so they're learning from disabled communities, perhaps from the first time, um, which is an incredible moment. So. We have a, a question. Uh, uh, such joy in your work. How do you find joy? Was there a particular inspirational moment where the joy was born out of? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I really love, I love what I do. So I feel like I get to have a lot of joy. To me, activism is the most joyful thing. I can remember literally uh, what year would it have been? 1998, being at a protest uh, at the University of Toronto, and um, we were holding these banners, and we were walking down uh, university, and the media stopped us, and they said, can we take your picture? And we stood there, and we smiled, and they said, no, 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 this is activism. It's serious. Don't smile. And I've always remembered that, because I was like, oh, they got it completely wrong, because they want to portray activism as this sort of drudgery but in fact it is so much fun if more people knew how fun it was more people would get involved in it you can meet friends you can meet lovers you can meet family you can make connections you can make artistic collaborations like all of this stuff can come from from getting involved in your community right like so much is is, is possible so to me activism has always given me joy as has my artistic practice and they both started about 25 years ago i started making art uh, uh, professionally 25 years ago and and 
and activism around the same time. And so they both have fueled uh, me, you know, in, in so many ways. But I also, you know, like, I think that Tucker Gomberg's words of having things in your life that fulfill you uh, outside of uh, production is so essential. So like, I have plant babies all over my apartment and they give me joy. I have a daughter who's nine, who's incredible and she gives me joy. And, you know, I have an identical twin and we have, you know, these incredible belly laughs and we're able to just sort of be together. And then I think about like what Monica Forrester said in that quote, like, you know, in her ideal city, it's when we're in these moments where we're all, where we, I mean, and I hope we get to be together again soon where we're laughing, where the music's playing, where you can feel the reverberation in your chest, where, where, where we're together. Uh, those are joyful moments in community. I think of things like Block Rama, which is this big black queer and trans festival here in, in the city. And those moments where you're just like, oh, I'm out and I'm surrounded by my people and that can be so joyful. And if you can hold on to that throughout the year, you know, it can carry you through. Mm, that's, yeah, that's lovely of, of um, of finding all of those moments uh, of joy when I think uh, maybe from, again, a, a non, maybe from an ableist community, a non-disability -disab community, there's a lot of grief going on that they're not used to. So um, yeah, thank you so much for your, for your passion of, of all of this. Um, we have a question here. Does harm reduction factor into your practice? Mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent for all kinds of harm reduction. So as an abolitionist, um, you know, to me, quite literally in terms of the most direct meaning of harm reduction, um, you know, I'm advocating for a safe supply. I'm advocating for decriminalization of all drugs. I'm advocating for drug users to get to be considered inherently valuable and that, that you know, that people who use drugs are people that I love and I want them to have all of the things and to be able to thrive and survive in this life. So uh, absolutely, you know, to me, disability justice is, is connected to harm reduction in so many ways because we're, we're advocating very similar things. Um, but then also thinking through all of the other ways that we can reduce the harm associated with whatever, you know? So, I have harm reduction practices in my artistic process, you know? How can I do this in a way that maybe I don't need to draw for the 85 hours straight just to see if I can do it? You know, what, what, you know, how can I do this in a way that still allows me to explore what I was exploring, but that doesn't tax my body? And then thinking about harm also um, in relation to, yeah, just, you know, in relation to abolition and, and the harm that happens in our communities and how we respond differently and what, what choices we can make and how we respond to harm. Um, we know that, you know, the traditional response is to go to punitive carceral strategies for responding to harm. And I would rather us think about starting from a place of love and responding to harm from a very different starting point. So to me, I think a lot about, um, harm and reduction of harm and uh, what it could mean for us because of course we all deserve the right to self-determination all of us all of us all of us and that's what we're fighting for here um, and a person is asking uh, um, I think they're they're uncertain maybe haven't heard the term mad before um, so they're just asking, mad in the context that you're using it means struggling with mental illness. As someone with chronic uh, mental illness, I'm not familiar with this usage, but I'm loving it. Yeah, so mad is like this term that we've tried to take back. I think people are reclaiming it. Often it's capitalized, you know, as, you know, a, a way of kind of showing the traditional marginalization of our, of, our, of our people from, even from within disability conversations. So separating out MAD and capitalizing it as a way of giving voice to an invisibilized experience, because of course, through through um, we, we get shut away, we get put in the hospital, we get shut away, we removed from our communities. I've been, you know, in psychiatric detention countless times, and, and that, you know, is a removing of us from our communities. And rather, we're saying, no, we want to be reinserted, actually. We want to be, we are part of these communities. We make these communities thrive. So that is a way of reclaiming uh, the beautiful variance of human emotion 
the beautiful variants of human biochemical uh, reactions in our brain and the beautiful variants of the ways that we think through things. So human beings have vastly different and amazing capacities to do all sorts of wonderful things with our brains. And we've been told that some of them are pathologized and some of them are normalized. And what Madness rather says is, what if we just looked at it all as part of the human experience? What if we expected madness? What if we desired it even and said, you know, that there are things that we can learn from this, that this, you know, my, I'm, I'm a proud mad person, you know, not to say that there are, well, I'm, I hate being depressed and I hate, you know, like I hate some of the parts of it where we can be frustrated with the experience at the same time as being proud of it being part of our identity and that it does allow us to see the world in a slightly different way and that that could be considered valuable. Mm -hmm. That there's there's gifts in in uh, in depression and anxiety and in all of the um, mental health. Uh, yeah, that's lovely. Um, we just have a comment here. Uh, someone was saying, "I was really uh, moved by the portraits. You were able to capture personal and intimate moments from people whose activism requires public assembly and public presence. The act of protest and IPOC experiences." Uh, tends to be reduced down to masses, losing the individual uh, uh, to the group. So seeing these individual uh, portraits was incredibly powerful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And we have a couple other, oh, we have so many more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, can you speak a little about what you were saying about exploring uh, what I was exploring, but in a way that doesn't harm my body. As a chronically ill dance artist, I'm definitely some, something I am exploring and would love to hear about that in your art process. Yeah, so I mean, I used to, um, I was very interested in seeing how far I could push it. Um, I wanted, to, I just wanted to know. And um, so I would draw these durational um, drawings, uh, sometimes at home, but sometimes in a gallery. And I would just be there for 85 hours and I would just sleep on a cot and I would just, you know, just do it. Um, and, you know, I, I, <laughs> I suppose it was like something I just had to do. I just had to go through that process just to kind of, I don't know, I was working something out. And now I'm like, okay, you know, I want to be able to do drawing when I'm 90. You know, I want to be able to get up in the morning and to feel energized enough uh, to go and and work on a drawing. Uh, and that's what I'm doing for the day. And if I'm going to be able to do this in the long run, then I'm going to have to be thinking through differently how I, I do this work. Mm. I think about Stacey Milburn and how she in her day job was like a ergonomics consultant for a company like on how to do uh, safe work environments so that you don't injure yourself or get repetitive strain and you know artists we need that we don't get a lot of coaching on how to do our practice in a way that is um, super safe for our body I mean if you're in dance I mean all of my dance friends I know they actually often get asked to push it uh, they get asked to push it just as part of being in the field um, and what it would mean and, and, you know, to push back and to say no. So in my own practice, I've been thinking a lot now about what sustainability would look like. And so, you know, uh, yeah, figuring out new ways of working that are more manageable um, and still as effective and fun. I mean, I still have as much joy working for five hours straight as I do for 85 hours straight. So I could just do five hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, Someone says, ooh, sorry. Uh, this presentation has made me feel seen as a disabled BIPOC person. Sorry for the ringing in the background. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, with your experiences in theater and performance, how do you uh, navigate the intense culture of ableism in theater while still trying to remember to center joy? I'm trying and struggling with this one now. Yeah, so I did for a couple of years, uh, worked with Sarah Garten Stanley, uh, the incredible Sarah Garten Stanley on a project called The Cycle at the National Arts Center that was specifically looking at 
um, making Canadian theater more um, a space for all of us, more a space where disabled artists, man artists, deaf artists could be uh, engaged in all areas of artistic production from creation to acting to lighting to stage design to do whatever. Um, not just thinking about access in terms of audience, right? Which is what the default always is. So what I learned from that process was we brought together theater practitioners from all across this north part of Toronto Island and Inuit Nunagat. And what I found out was that so many of us had these same struggles. You know, the theater space isn't accessible or the theater space isn't affordable or, you know, there isn't a space where we can re rehearse or practice or the grant isn't something that I can access or that, like, there was just so many things that were, um, you know, we were being typecast in roles if we ever got them. Like, there was just so many ways that, that were very familiar. And so thinking through together about how we can kind of push back against that. I mean, for me, I have found a lot of joy in self-creation. So I started writing plays. I started writing the theater that I wasn't seeing. You know, I started creating work that I wasn't seeing. And by doing that, I was able to create the conditions for performance, rehearsal, practice that worked. I can remember being part of an incredible play. I was so happy to be part of it. I was so thrilled. Um, but the, the rehearsal schedule broke me. I mean, as a disabled artist, it was just completely inaccessible to do that many hours every single day, even though I understand why that's the, you know, discipline of the theater, <laughs> but it like, it didn't work for me. So when I do my work, we do it in a totally different way. We do it in chunks. We do it in breaks. We do it in, we, 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 we can crip our process. We can crip our timelines. So I found a lot of joy in self-production because you can control the, con the conditions a bit more. And I work largely with other disabled artists, you know, who are like down with, you know, doing this in a good way. Um, so that's one of the ways that I've been able to do it. But I think that in any theater environment that I get into, I try to push back and be like, okay, how can I make this? How can I make sure that I'm setting the example for what an accessible option could look like? And good luck, you got this. <laughs> Well, that is all the time we have for questions. I just want to thank you so much, Cyrus. Um, I hope to live as much joy and passion as, as you have shown just with the, the, the 40 minute talk you have done. Um, yeah, it, it's quite something. It, it's a reminder for me of, of how strong uh, the disability community is. And, and here in Victoria, I think our disability community is, is um, growing and, and will strengthen um, as as we hear from people from all over. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for your time and thank you all for for joining us. I I feel like um, I hope all of you uh, felt the the passion and the joy that that Cyrus um, and and I hope that this uh, helps encourage that with others. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. All power to the people. <laughs>